Thank you. Thank you for the very, very nice introduction. Um, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, it's my great pleasure to come to Dartmouth. This is a wonderful place. I spent the past 48 hours meeting with uh, wonderful colleagues in Dartmouth. I learned about you know, the wonderful environment in terms of you know, the student education, student faculty collaborations in research. And most importantly for me, is a very close focus environment with wonderful clinicians, medical doctors in medical school. Really, this is a fantastic place to uh, carry on the vision, you know, moving along the area of doing engineering and medicine, move forward in that direction. So today, I want to present an overview of our research on the topic of engineering biology and medicine at a very small scale. And this is a very large topic, but I want to give you a sense of what the small scale engineering, what can some advancement in nanomaterials, microsystems, can really push the frontiers moving forward to move a better efficient healthcare. So I'll talk about uh, a few projects, and depending upon the time we have, uh, range from fundamental biology, cell manipulations, sorting, molecular screening, and all the way towards translational applications in early cancer detection. So before I start, I look over you know, the materials and try to figure out how deep I should go, or how broad I should go. And I read over the statement on John's uh, seminar, and I pick two big themes out of this, which is I should present the big pictures, first of all. And second is I want to encourage live discussions. I had many live discussions during the past 48 hours, so if I lost my voice over the time, please forgive me, and, and I try to speak louder for that. So the grand vision is really on the notion of personalized biology and medicine powered by this engineering advancement, you know, in terms of militarization, integration, and automation. So starting from 1950s, we see this tremendous progress in terms of making information technology to be you know, personal, more efficient, through this so-called integrated circuits, design, miniaturization, and all shrink onto the microchip scale. And due to that effort, due to the past 60 years, we see the tremendous advancement of getting so wonderful array of personal computing devices, consumer electronics, from portable computers, laptops, from this iPod, right, iPad, enjoy the music and movies on handheld devices. So the question is whether we can do the same thing for biology and chemistry, whether we can make it as the same big impact as we did for the electronics and information technologies. And right now the biology and medicine is pretty much still a labor intensive process, right? We have you know, technicians to handle over cell cultures, do very simple manipulation technique, cell injections, cell assembly, and um, most recent time, we see this array type of platform coming to the genome analysis first, the Affymetrix genomes. But whether we can expand that idea and make the platform to be really targeted towards individualized medicine, right? Depend upon individual characteristics and then make diagnosis, then make therapy and, uh, on a personal level. So it's really towards so called personalized medicine at the point of care, right? Whenever you need that care, you can get that service. And before I start, I go back a thousand steps back, introduce some of the basic technology we use to develop the research. And Chris gave me a wonderful tour for the microfabrication facilities here, and also instruction labs, which I enjoy a lot. But let me uh, just introduce very briefly some of the keywords show up again and again in the research. One is this, uh, the so-called MEMS, the microelectromechanical systems. It's a, a, a microsystem for really couple multiple functions, electrical functions, you know, mechanical functions, and sometimes optical functions, microfluidics, and so forth. This is an extension of integration circuits manufacturing a technology to fabricate planar three-dimensional structures, right? Go beyond the capability of handling electrons by having moving structures, actuators, sensors on, on the same chip. And applying those MEMS into Biomedicine, you have this term called biomass. And let's go a thousand times, uh, a thousand times smaller in dimension, so we have this uh, nanotechnology, so essentially any materials, any structures with a feature dimension below 500 nanometers, you efficiently end up with that nanomaterial region. So compare with most of the microsystems approach where you have uh, reductionism approach, having the top down, you know, having the design and then cut down the material, etching, deposition, and then sacrificing the layers, making small structures. In the nanotechnology, you have this bottom up approach, right? The ideas you borrow, 
this concept from chemistry and physics, try to assemble material by manipulating single atoms and sing single uh, unit cells and the crystals and so forth. And the bio nanotechnology, this is a very broad area, right? You can think about essentially many exciting research ongoing, especially here. I mean, we have a, a wonderful efforts using nanoparticles for cancer diagnosis and therapy. It's uh, one uh, very good example of the application. And just having intuitive pictures, and here we can build various devices based on traditional silicon wafers. You know, engineers use that to build, to build microelectronics, build the circuits. Or we can extend that idea into build other type of structures. Like here is showing is a <clears throat> micro mirror structure. It's a micro scanner I built in my own lab. And the scanner is, you can think about just as a reflecting surface around two axes, right? That can reflect photons, create a raster scan. And that scanner can enable, you know, multiple uh, multi-imaging modalities. You can perform confocal image, can perform optical coherent image, build up endoscopes to really look into the areas which cannot be accessible by tremendous larger dimension tools. And there are some uh, very unique design in terms of building microsystems. It doesn't need to be that complicated, right? So here is showing it's a self-assembly array. You know, interestingly, if you visit biology lab, nowadays when they assemble the cell, it's still pretty much a manual process. You know, they have microscopes set up, robotic stations line up by hands one by one. But the idea here is you can functionize the surface to be hydrophobic, hydrophilic, where you can, through this surface property alternation, you can perform very efficient self-assembly. And I will show you a short video just to entertain you uh, right after this. And nanomaterials, we talk about the nanoparticles. You can use nanoparticles for imaging and also for drug delivery, for diagnosis, right? Multiple uh, functionalities. And there was no clear line to divide nano and micro, right? So when we talk about the nano, that's what we're familiar with, at least from public media point of view. But there was some very interesting integration between nano and the micro. And here is one example, you know, for the uh, researchers, the students we work in nanotechnology, we know scanning probe is one of the very popular tool doing nanometrology. And one idea here showing is we can really deposit a array of quantum dots, right? You can sample quantum dots to the level of single, you know, dots and put them on the tip of the scanning probe. If you can make them shine, then suddenly have this single quantum dots resolution light source. Right. Quantum dots can be five, six nanometers. So this is an example of showing you can interface, you can interface nanomaterial with microsystems and microstructures and make a functional you know, light emitting light tip from this structure. And I won't have time to talk more for the application for that structure, but if you heard about a near field scanning optical microscope, that couple the light all the way to the scanning probe tip, and you can do the topographic measurements coupled with the near field optical transmission measurements. But the limit over there is the optical resolution is limited by the aperture size of the fiber tip. So intuitively, as an engineer, <clears throat> if you can shrink the aperture size by thousand times, you can improve the resolution tremendously. <clears throat> so this idea is try to build a new type of ensemble scanning probe. Okay? So this is a good collection of the examples showing from micro to nano, MEMS nanomaterials, which can enable a vast array of applications. Now here is uh, one example I want to show you. Before I play the video, and this is a, a gold pad, very simple deposition of a gold, and through lift off process you define gold pads. And the, the, the reason we want to do this is we want to create a very effective platform where you can do a self-assembly of the cells. If you have a array of those gold pads, you disperse the cell on the surface, and you want to have all the cells, all the embryos sitting on the pads, but nowhere else, no, no, nowhere else. Uh, we talk the scale. The scale is here is relatively large. We have uh, 200 micron by 400 microns. But here the key points is I want to show you can really alternating the hydrophobic properties and the hydrophilic properties, and through this self assembly process, having that Drosophila embryos sitting on the top of the pads. And very quickly, let's see how that play out. And this is the functionalized surface gold pads, and we direct the water flow towards this embryo and you begin to see the embryo tend to move a little bit towards the left-hand side. But very reluctant. It didn't want to leave. But if you increase the flow rate, which means increase the lateral force on the embryo, finally it improves, it's a move. 
How about this compared with just the bare surface without any hydrophobic, hydrophilic uh, modification? When you turn on the water flow, you just blow it away right on the spot, right? So this is a very simple idea, but that really shows the power of you can apply those techniques uh, combined with surface chemistry and provide a very useful platform for uh, self-assembly. And this was one of the platforms we used early on to couple with micro-injections to perform very efficient RNA interference, so part of my uh, thesis work. So the key words is <coughs> doing the miniaturization, integration, and automation. Okay? Um, and the theme is we couple nanomaterials, integrate with microsystems, uh, bring the significance in biomedicine, and really create a translational impact. And the areas we look into are microimaging and low profile sensing and uh, cell manipulation, through, uh, which can potentially impact a few areas in uh, clinical applications, from uh, digital pathology to uh, cell biomechanics. And today, I know we have a limited amount of time, so I want to uh, highlight a few projects. But I, before I do that, I want to give an overview of the research program we developed at the University of Texas at uh, Austin over the past seven and a half years. Our fundamental questions are at two levels. So we try to address some of the fundamental biology questions, uh, look at the single cells, and then uh, look into the cell manipulation technologies and perform efficient microinjection at genetic level doing efficient RNA interference and study cell mechanics you know, using the probe we talk about to probe the cell and then study how that membrane mechanics can uh, develop and influence development network. And another focus is how that will introduce uh, any significance in the uh, clinical applications in terms of early cancer diagnosis, drug delivery, screening, and implantable biosensors. And our efforts is always distributed on two fronts. And on one side, I want to be a, a true biomedical engineer. So I really want to move into the areas doing the high throughput screening, also the real-time in vivo diagnosis. But on the other side, I'm an engineer by definition, by training. So I want to continue to move along the fundamental technology and make the platform to be robust, make the innovation to be sustainable. I think these two are, you know, go hands in hands. It's not in conflict. In order to move sustainable innovation in bioengineering, in engineering medicine, we have to have a very strong engineering focus. So those two aspects, <coughs> I give uh, uh, some examples. Oops. I give some examples listed here and including the projects I'm going to talk about, developing the microchip uh, to so-called liquid biopsy for early cancer diagnosis. And also the uh, endoscope design enabled by the microscanners we talk about. But meanwhile, we also uh, look at the fundamental engineering design issues, right? So how would you design nano patterns on microsystems, enable high efficient sensing, and enable microscopic imaging with sufficient resolution? So today's topic, I want to introduce uh, three topics with the first two uh, correlate with in, uh, using the microchip to high support uh, screening of the uh, blood and identify so-called circulating tumor cells. The last topic, if I have time, I want to talk about some of the recent efforts on doing miniaturized cancer imaging microscope. I know we have a top-notch uh, optical imaging group here in, in uh, uh, addressing the early detection of cancer and then combined with uh, uh, therapy. And I hope these two, uh, these three topics will become a complementary part of, uh, you know, stimulating some of the discussions, how to combine the strengths from device side to the system towards translational application and make it a whole portfolio. And we know, I don't want to give statistics about cancer, but, you know, cancer is uh, now the, the, the leading cause of mortality uh, for the world, in the second to the cardiovascular disease. And cancer cures by metastasis, right? We know if we, know, we have identified the solid tumor region, it's just becoming relatively straightforward. It would go there, do the imaging, do the cut, and, uh, and hopefully that will achieve the best results. But cancer, uh, the, the solid tumor uh, shed over the cancer cells into the circulation, and that circul some of the percentage of the cells will eventually become viable and then redeposit into other organs and sometimes into the bone marrow become so-called the cancer-initiating cells, tumor-initiating cells. And those cells are viable, and, and a, a small population of those will have the uh, capabilities as uh, cancer stem cells, right? That, so that will trigger lots of interesting questions of whether you can capture that cells and then study metastasis mechanism of cancer. 
through capture those cells, and you can do a array of you know, fascinating experiments and molecular analysis, look at the genome, look at comparison of the, the cancer cell, circulating tumor cell genome with the solid tumor cell genome, and uh, find out cancer mutation and so forth. So this becomes um, a, a viable method, a viable uh, venue where you can look into the mechanism of metastasis. And this method we call it a liquid biopsy, right? And in a general biopsy, you take part of the patient, you cut a piece of tissue, bring it to microscope, right? It's uh, sometimes not so convenient, and especially in the bone marrow case, it's aspiration bone marrows from patients. It's painful, time costly, and that causes tremendous pressure on both sides, on patients and on the surgeon. For liquid biopsy, you draw 7.5 mil blood um, from time to time. It's affordable, it's doable. You can do it in the, in the low resource infrastructure settings, right? So those are um, much more preferred way compared we do just regular you know, invasive biopsies. And from the clinical models, <clears throat> it's interesting, you know, when I talk about this project, I got lots of questions asked about how many cells, how many circulating tumor cells are really sufficient. And this is really dependent upon the cancer model. And from this uh, clinical models, for example, for breast, date, uh, for breast and prostate cancers, if you identify five CDCs and above out of every 7.5 uh, mil blood, right? Compare with those samples, the patients with the blood samples, with CDC less than five CDCs uh, per 7.5 mil blood. The survival rate is, you know, cutting in half. The survival timeline is cutting in half, right? So the number of CDCs, a numeration of CDCs out of this 7.5 mil or certain amount of uh, volume of the blood is very critical uh, parameter to not only for early cancer diagnosis. You know, when we start this project, we have this great promise of doing early cancer diagnosis. But later on, we become more realistic. We think numeration, identification of circulating tumor cells became very important in terms of risk assessment you know, to make a justification how the patient respond to chemotherapy, respond to hormone therapy. Right? This is a way to benchmark the effectiveness of the therapy. And... Um, uh, just for your information, there was uh, a bunch of other technologies in this space I will introduce uh, in the next couple of slides. And for example, you know, this is a very hot topic, so everybody try to jump in. And uh, uh, the approach proposed by Harvard Medical School, the Mentoners Group, they introduced a couple microchips over the past five years. So those microchips, one of the chips is showing here, published in Nature, <coughs> they're showing a array of micropillars, right? So those are three-dimensional structure in the micro channels. And on the surface of micropillar, they code it with uh, antibody, so anti-EPCAM, endothelial cell adhesion molecules, right? It, using the immunoassay, uh, antigen antibody binding. So once you have the blood running through the, the cell, you can imagine when my talk is over, you're all running through this door, you bump into the pillars, if the pillar into the hallway. So if you increase the number of pillars and increase the density of those pillars, the probability of the cell going to bump into the pillar is high, right? So it's a capture through that mechanism. And um, they're showing the very first paper using microchip to do the capture. But this has a few issues in, in, in terms of uh, what type of uh, ant antibody you want to code on the surface. Because it's in the cancer community well known, different cancer cell lines, they have different uh, surface molecules expressed. And even for the same uh, surface molecule, they have different <laughs> level expression, right? Some you know, breast cancer have uh, 57,000 EPCAM express for prostate that go to 10 times higher. So one solution doesn't really fit on, right? And their second chip is uh, having a similar idea, but they're having also other type of three-dimensional structures building the microchip uh, channel and capture using a similar phenomenon, but by using a different structure that create different uh, you know, flow dynamics in a, in a flow channel. And other approach, including the Caltech approach, this is, uh, I think it's a uh, um, a simple approach, but it shows certain effects, which is assuming the CDCs have different size compared with blood cells. Right? So blood cell, the normal uh, dimension, red blood cell, white blood cell, from anywhere 5 to 8 microns. But for circulating tumor cells, the size can go beyond 10 microns, so 10 to 20 microns. If you just, as a mechanical engineer, if you think about this question, I can do just mechanical design of having a membrane, different holes with, with larger size, uh, with a smaller size. I do a filtration of the blood, you know, from the patient, and, and then, you know, the cancer cell will tend to stay on the membrane because it's a larger cell. 
uh, circulating tumor cells stay on the top, and then all the blood cells going through, right? So this is a, uh, a simple idea, and they show there's some uh, efficacy by using these membranes, but the problem is, you know, this is not really specific to uh, uh, certain cancer cells with this you know, wonderful knowledge about the surface molecule expression on the cell surface. And another technology developed by Stanford, they call the mega sweeper. So this is a array of magnetic rods, and they dip into the blood samples, and then wait a few minutes, and then the, the, uh, the blood are mixed with magnetic nanoparticles. You know, they, through the antigen antibody binding, they will attach to the particles, and then these magnetic rods provide another traction force to enrich these uh, CDCs with nanomagnetic particles. And on the market, because this is a <clears throat> so exciting area, not only from you know, the research point of view, but also from the clinical applications, there was uh, a machine produced by Johnson & Johnson, and they spin off a company called the Veridex, right? So they produce a machine called the Cell Search, and in the machine they have a big uh, magnet, permanent magnets, and they have a testing tube. And they mix particles, nanoparticles, nanomagnetic particles with the blood, and they put in the in the middle of this spherical you know, magnetic uh, field. And through this enrichment process that we talk about, they can really concentrate the cells in the middle of the testing tube. And after doing that, this is separation, right? They do a, a real-time uh, uh, fluorescent imaging to so take an image of those uh, labeled, fluorescently labeled cancer cells and then transmit to a computer. Right? This is a very nice machine, only machine get FDA approved. But the problem is, you know, if you want to do further analysis beyond just taking fluorescent image, right? Just beyond doing enumeration, you want to do cell lysing, you want to do PCR, you want to do fish analysis, you want to do single cell profiling, which is hot nowadays, right? Doing single cell system biology that won't offer that capabilities, right? So this is a I mean, very nice machine and we, we carry on experiments using this as a control comparison, but it has its own limitations. I think that offers uh, what we can do in academia to really move uh, the frontier forward. So our approach is a combination of immunomagnetic assay with some of the nice features offered by microfluidics in terms of keep it very small volume, uh, very near near field cross interactions between magnetic field and then the, uh, the, cancer, the, the cancer cells. There are a couple of key steps. One is you label the circulating tumor cells with uh, iron oxide nanoparticles. Uh, I know we have a very strong efforts here developing iron oxide particles for imaging applications. And here the magnetic nanoparticles perform two functions. Number one is to provide magnetic momentum. After capture, can pull the cells to the positions we want. And second is the surface of nanoparticles coated with a gold layer. So we know gold layer is nice in a way of provide the scattering phenomenons in the bright field imaging, but also is a very nice a layer to uh, provide you know, the, the, the coating with uh, dextrin and then antibodies, which can potentially uh, attach to antigen, you know, provide this recognition uh, mechanism to capture the cancer cells. Um, and in this microchip design, we have uh, the permanent magnets underneath to perform this uh, attraction. You know, there are some fine details I will walk through uh, in the next few slides. <clears throat> so the antibodies we can code, including uh, EPICAM, EGFR, uh, growth factors, uh, antibodies, but now we can also do in this multiplexing coding of multiple antibodies, right? So by doing multiplexing, um, you can provide a better capture efficiency. And this, <clears throat> the microchip-based immunomagnetic assay, there are multiple parameters which can affect the capture sensitivity. I think this part is really getting engineers excited, right? As engineers, we always want to turn the knobs and try to try out different uh, optimization scheme and try to see, well, if I change this parameter, what will happen, right? But if you want to translate into clinical settings, uh, they hate it. They just want to say, give me something simple. I just push a button to use it. And that, that's, I think, two different uh, way of thinking about, you know, the end goal is the same. We want to provide, optimize the platform, you know, straightforward and then easy to use. But in the R&D process, we can tune multiple parameters like volume, flow rate, the, the channel dimensions, and then, you know, the nanoparticle uh, design in terms of how large a core will be, you know, how large magnetic momentum will be, and to tune the uh, capture uh, process to be uh, more efficient. So this is the very first generation of uh, the chip. 
uh, we, we came up with a couple years ago. And yesterday in a small group presentation, I present the current version, which is you know, licensed to a company. They make a very nice version of microchip. But this chip uh, really shows you know, initial functionalities of this combination, the magnetic, uh, permanent magnets coupled with uh, the micro Fourier channel to perform this deposition, capture CDCs on the bottom glass slides. And for the magnetic nanoparticles, we use either the customized nanoparticles developed within UT Austin, and we also use uh, particles uh, ferrofluidic from uh, Veridex. And either way, we achieve uh, uh, very interesting results. And our goal is really try to move into customized nanoparticles, which can functionalize, conjugate using multiple uh, antibodies. And here is uh, a TEM image of showing the particles, you know, six nanometer diameter, 120, 100 to 200 nanometers in, in uh, diameter from uh, Faraday's nano, nanoparticles. Okay, so those particles are dispersed as shown here, but some of them are also clustered, right? So they, uh, when they have a cluster, they have a, a different impact on the, on the cell uh, on the capture efficiency. And I introduced this very quickly about the structure for the nanoparticles. And uh, the gold layer really provides two functions, right? The bio function, also imaging function. Uh, and the bright field provides the scattering phenomenon that make the capture cells to be more visible. And another interesting question is, if you think about the physics of the cell capture, right? So theoretically, we can use fax and max to capture the cells, do the cell sorting, no question about it. But the issue is, for those generalized instrumentation, it's always about specificity and the efficiency. If you want to sort out the rare cells, using fax and the max may not be efficient. It's not efficient, right? Looking to the procedure, not efficient. Especially for the CTC separation. The, the, the question from the physics point of view is, you really sort out a needle out of the haystack. You know, the CDC, the number of CDCs is only a few out of a mil, milliliter blood. But if you compare with the background noise, per se, the background noise in terms of the red blood cells, in terms of the white blood cells, it's in the order of millions and billions. So you pick up one cell out of 10 to the order of six, 10 to the order of nine. And the question is, if you just come up with very straightforward micro Fourier channels, there was no way you can efficiently separate these two. And every cell tend to like a particle, right? They eventually will fall down on the bottom of the floor. So eventually you will have a CDC capture on the surface mixed with all the blood cells. And we do a the simulation, we do a computer modeling and design to simulate the effect of this blood sedimentation, how that will impact the capture efficiency, and then how that will impact this so-called signal noise ratio, right? If you define capture CDCs to be the ultimate goal. And this turns out to be a very important question. And I want to just lead to that uh, conclusion of, you know, Instead of operating micro Fourier chip just as a steady state, if you continue rotating the microchips to be, you know, implant and then flip it over 180 degree, this gravity effects on the capture efficiency is tremendous. If you flip it over for those non-specific capture with magnetic particle attached with CDC bonded to the glass slides with permanent magnets, those non-specific bonded cells are gonna fall off, right? Fall in the direction of gra gravitation. Okay, so if you do rotation design for operation of the microchip, that will increase your capture efficiency. That's the whole idea. And that's simple operation backed up by this careful design consideration of uh, engineering uh, microchip. <coughs> so this is uh, showing the, uh, the, the trajectory of the cells uh, flowing through the microchip under these two different operations, right? The flip-flop and then the static operations. <coughs> So in both cases, we screen, uh, screening the blood at uh, 10 mil per, uh, per hour. That the screen speed, by the way, is four times higher than the machine on the market uh, from Johnson & Johnson. And this is the, the prototype we're using in the, in the laboratory uh, nowadays. As we speak, <coughs> we use a prototype to screen the patient blood uh, shipped to us from UT Southwestern Medical Centers in Dallas. So it's uh, uh, three hours uh, driving distance, and uh, because you know the attractiveness of our machine, we still get collaboration from medical doctors three hours away. And at one time, I got a phone call also from the director of uh, blood bank in MD Anderson, and he's saying, "Can we place your machine at the front door of the the blood bank and just as a check of whether the blood is in good shape before I putting it into the bank?" Okay. 
and I'm saying, oh, not yet. We still have to you know, make it reliable and make it to be multi-channels. But anyway, anyway, this technology is scalable in the sense of what I'm showing here, this machine is a six channel. In other words, I have six chips in parallel. I can sequence, I can screen in six samples at one time. I think this is the one of the advantage bring up by the microchip and the microsystem technology, which is it's a scalable. There was no fundamental limits. You cannot scale up to 20 channels and 24 channels. And I have a short video here, which I want to show you this flip-flop operation as we just talked about. <clears throat> so the microchip is flipped 180 degree during the screening. So the unpatched blood cell, white blood cell, and white blood cell will flow off from this uh, surface where CDC will be captured. And then the syringe, six channel syringe is arrayed around on the top. Okay. So this technology licensed to nanolite systems, and this is the the second batch of technology outsourced to industry. So my first set of technology was on the endoscope design, which I hope will introduce very quickly uh, by the end of this talk. So this, this is the uh, first part about this uh, microchip do the patient blood screening identify the cancer cells. And we can map out distribution of these CDCs captured on the slides in a very precise way across this channel. And then we can couple it into the second stage of this uh, experiments, which is about the identification. And we carry out three sets of experiments to you know, characterize this technology. One set is you do spike cells into a buffer solution. The second set of experiments is you do spike cells into a blood uh, samples. The third experiment is what we are doing right now. You can collect patient samples from medical school, from hospitals, and ship to us doing the screening of uh, cancer cells. And I want to have a quick introduction of this capture rate. Capture rate is a ratio between number of counted CDC cells on experimental slides divided by number of CDC cells on control slides. So due to human error, sometimes you see the um, capture rate is over 100%. So in that case, that means very high capture rate. Don't take it at uh, the face value. It cannot be over 100%. It's just the <coughs> error margin put it in. Okay. And for the spike cancer cell detection, we did um, three different uh, cancer cell lines, so SBR3 cells, uh, column 205 cells, and PC3 cells, uh, three cell lines. So for breast cancer, for the colon cancer, for the prostate cancer. And then the capture rate in all the cases is uh, fairly high, as you see from the, from the table. And this result was published <coughs> recently uh, on the spike experiments on the uh, colon cancers and also the breast cancers with different testing conditions and ranging from uh, using the 30 microliter per milliliter uh, concentration ferrofluidic uh, solutions, 7.5 uh, microliter uh, milliliter concentration and the various flow rate. And we have a, a pretty good average capture rate. And the most recent development I want to introduce before I jump into the clinical testing results is there was lots of engineering innovations which can further, further build in this microchip. As one example, you know, we can build the so-called small-scale magnets within these microchannels. But I know in the theater school of engineering, we have a, a few groups very good at microfabrication, study magnetic materials, build a small magnets and thin films on the, uh, on the MEMS device. So similar idea can be implemented here. If we introduce the small magnets at the bottom of the channel. Combined with the permanent magnets outside the channel, you can really enhance and tailor this local distribution magnetic field. Right? That, the whole idea is you want to make capture to be more efficient. And again, as an engineer, I don't want to lose that part. You know, I, I think I'm giving a talk here in engineering school, and these are the equations we are comfortable to see. You know, once you design the array of micromagnets, we don't do it randomly. We have a way to really look at how to widely distribute capture the cells, how to enhance this local magnetic field for efficient capture. So there are design equations for that regarding the periodicity of the micromagnets uh, micro and also the, uh, the size and dimension of those uh, small magnets. 
And these are the simulations. And using the simulation, we guide the design of this microchip. And technology-wise, it's fairly straightforward. Uh, just doing the thermal deposition of chrom uh, chromium and nickel film, and then you do the lift off, creating this um, uh, small scale micromagnets. And I was invited to give a talk in Hawaii last December uh, as a selected group to talk about the micro nanotechnology in biomedicine. I think this really opened lots of opportunities to integrate new materials, new, new magnetic materials, with some um, you know, simple fabrication technique to enable multifunctional microchip to enhance better cell capture. <clears throat> so the second part is uh, the re re recognition. By the way, these two figures compare uh, with this small-scale magnets and then without small-scale small, small magnets, how that will uh, enhance not only capture, but make the captured cells to be distributed over a wider area for better identification. And this is a, the fluorescent microscope uh, image showing the captured cells. And this is a BT20 cell, uh, cancer cells on the left, a column 205 cancer cells uh, in the middle, and then the cluster of two column 205 cells um, on the right. And this is the second part of the capture. So we do staining of the cells using three colors, right? CD45, uh, uh, the, the cytokeratin, and DAPI. So two positive tests, one negative test make a benchmark of uh, how that cells can be recognized. Okay. I have 10 more minutes, right? Okay. All right. So I want to uh, run a little bit faster in terms of talk about the recognition. And this is, again, the image showing the captured cancer cells. And we have uh, two collaborators, and Jonathan Orr and Jean Franco, the two top immunologists in uh, uh, UT Southwestern Cancer Center. And Jonathan Ward himself uh, didn't win Nobel Prize, but one of his students, Linda Bach, was 2004 uh, Nobel Prize in physiology. Okay, he's a remarkable person. He's a wonderful collaborator. And we, we're doing this two positive tests and then one active test for identification of captured cancer cells. It's beautiful cancer cells. And uh, we have tested over the time uh, over 20 patients, and we even follow some of the patients in terms of the ser uh, therapy, and then uh, to uh, the captured cancer cells and then put in the database and try to as a way to um, follow their prognosis process. We even compare with uh, some of the cell search results. So cell search, by the way, it's a, a pricing instruments and uh, the price is uh, over half million dollar for one equipment. And for every assay, you spend $3,000 to buy the uh, ferrofluidic and the quantity is about for six patient screening. So it's, I think it's advanced instruments, but really we need such capabilities at a lower cost and to be widely available to not only medical researchers, but to clinicians. And I hope this gives you an idea of this specific project we, uh, we are doing to do high throughput screening for early cancer detection. Okay. And these are the conclusions for this part. But I want to quickly run through the the, the two topics I, I promise you I have a quick introduction. The second part is actually shorter because you know, now you know the technology for capture, the CDCs. And the idea is really on the identification part, right? So the micro chip, you can capture with high efficiency. You, know, you can uh, put in the cells on the slides for further enumeration for downstream analysis. But in terms of detection, how about the idea if we go beyond three colors? How about we perform hyperspectrum, you know, multi-spectrum detection? And over the time, we had a technology of putting the quantum dots, uh, putting the quantum dots on a, on a single, let's see, putting a quantum dots on a curved surface and also on a flat surface, right? We know the quantum dots offer this quantum size effect. If you tailor the size of the quantum dots, you can make them to be, you know, changing emission, uh, uh, emission wavelengths. Right. So this is a, the, the idea we have is whether we can pattern the quantum dots now in a real format, you know, generating multi-wavelength light source and coupled with this microchip with a CDC detached and stained. And then you can have a compact system uh, to collect those uh, uh, transmission information you know, as a function of the wavelengths. Right? And then you make a better justification that way. And then the ultimate idea is <coughs> to have this uh, integrated 
planar optical system. I had a wonderful talk with Elsa in the, in the morning, also yesterday, about uh, further uh, bringing the microphotonics, per se, into imaging and sensing. And this really opened up that type of capabilities. You have this uh, micro well array can be, you know, slides can be uh, cell manipulation device coupled with uh, light source. You can build also other type of planar devices and make it to be <coughs> integrated microsystems. <coughs> so as a proof of principle, we demonstrate the photoluminescence of uh, quantum dots array, right? This is uh, shining through the, uh, the cellular arrays, and we try it over on a group of cancer cell, uh, 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 cancer cell lines, and we demonstrate uh, sufficient uh, intensity collected from the quantum dots light source compared with just regular light source. <coughs> and we have it uh, tried on the SKBR3 cell, the breast cancer cell line. So as we talk about, uh, we stay with uh, quantum, quantum dots 625. Uh, this is a, a group of quantum dots excited using the lower wavelengths quantum dots, right? That energy transfer, you can really collect this uh, fluorescent image. And these are the <coughs> group of images we using the excitation using uh, quantum dots LEDs, but justify these parameters the cytoplasma, cytoplasma, nuclear cytoplasma ratio, right, to uh, uh, and also calibrate the absorption of different parts in the cells. You know, the nuclei tend to absorb more at 560 nanometers compared with cytoplasma. Uh, so this very early stage, you know, justification on the cells uh, illuminated by multiple spectrum light source really provide a way of initial cellular microarrays, you can make in the first order justification whether this is a, a, a scenario you can further into quantitative analysis in a clinical setting. Okay. And these are the few images just showing the cancer cell imaging on the uh, prostate cancers where you can uh, really read out the, the different signatures of uh, nuclear absorption compared with uh, cytoplasma absorption and make justifications of nuclear size and so forth. So this integration technology combining the quantum dots LED, right, the on-chip light source with the biochip which captures the cells provide a, a complete solution which you can enable identification on the captured cells to be easier, straightforward, with a higher resolution as well. So the very last topic is a little bit depart from the first two in the sense of if you think about the first two, it's all belong to the idea of doing liquid biopsy, right? And the last part is really designing a small-scale microscope, um, uh, which hopefully you can do the optical uh, sectioning on, and do the optical biopsy, you know, doing miniaturized imaging, microimaging. So here I introduce only one imaging modality we develop, but I think the technology can be expanded into other imaging uh, methods and make endoscope, make microimaging a, reali a reality. Okay. And the cancer facts, we know, you know, I talk about these keywords throughout my presentation. This is 85% of the cancer origin from epithelial layers. So if you claim you can do early cancer detection, we better look at this a couple hundred micron below the skin surface, identify any abnormal features, abnormal morphologies, uh, cytoplasma ratio difference you know, morphology difference in terms of the tissue profile. And the current, the gold standard is using this uh, radiation-based screening, and we do the surgical uh, excision uh, biopsy analysis, and going through this uh, process, you know, in the skin cancers, we go through this more surgery, right? You detect the margins, you go back to cut, and then take a tissue, go to a pathology lab, further diagnosis, and feedback to the uh, surgeon and the, the, the clinics. And we try to achieve here is really uh, try to do a, a, a simple procedure which can transform this biopsy process. Um, this MEMS devices I introduced at the beginning of my talk, uh, it's a just two-dimensional rotating surface which can direct photons into different directions. And whether we can integrate this micro device into a, a handheld probe and therefore really impact the biopsy protocol in terms of shortening the time and the increase in the efficiency is uh, the goal for these studies. So this scanner has been applied in many scenarios, right? You can see, you can find them, the different scanner designs in uh, 
this so-called DAC, confocal microscope, developed in the Chris Contact group in Stanford. But also there are some other applications. And one of our uh, innovation was integrate this MEM scanner with uh, optical coherent tomography. So this technology was licensed to a company called the Cardio Spectrum in 2007. So this was acquired by Volcano uh, Imaging. The idea is design this OCT probe uh, into look into a cardiovascular system with forward imaging uh, capabilities. Okay. And my vision is really try to combine this uh, MEM scanner or other type of microphotonic structures together with uh, different imaging modes. We have demonstrated confocal reflectance image, diffusion, fluorescent image, and two-photo imaging. So all the three systems are in place uh, in my uh, group, and we link them into oral cancer detection with a handheld format, with skin cancer detection, the, the handheld format, and also coupled with the, the, the microchips, which can capture the cancer cells and combine the imaging with the capture capabilities. And the different instrumentation look into different space in terms of imaging penetration and then the resolution. Right? We know OCD has been very useful looking to morphology and deep tissues, millimeter, but lateral resolution, maybe microns. And confocal, we are looking to shallow layers, couple hundred micron below the skin surface, but look into like half micron resolution in, in the lateral direction. Right? So this fit in really a, a big category of we can shrink the footprint of vast variety of imaging system towards these applications where we need, uh, you know, very tight space. We, we have very tight space. We have limited amount of time. And this is the scanner characteristic, and we have uh, uh, demonstrated this is a confocal reflectance microscope, and here is a video showing this operation of the scanners, right? It's a, it's a beautiful device which can rotate along its two axes and create a raster scan. Create a raster scan as showing uh, in this, if you incorporate into the critical uh, pieces, which is a handheld probe for the confocal case, uh, this confocal is performing optical section technique layer by layer into these depth directions and combine them into three dimensional features, right? So you can create such a small probe enabled by MEM scanner and provide very useful physiological uh, situ uh, images for early cancer detection. And for any technology, you know, new technology, you have to compare with uh, the gold standard, right? So this is a comparison of the image taken using our MEMS handheld probe with uh, <coughs> the image taken from uh, Olympus microscope. And what is nice here is when you design a small probe, you always try to balance the field of view with resolution, right? So field of view may be small, but uh, we have tremendous advanced computing power nowadays. You can acquire small frames and then stick them together, making a mosaic type of uh, image that will somewhat compensate for the field of view and then you know, issues and then combine with solution which can provide the best, best resolution laterally. And our goal is trying towards this handheld probe and for one for this confocal applications look into the oral cancer detection space. You know, and we can talk about oral cancer if we have time but this is unfortunate one type of uh, cancer cause very high mortality compared with other type. You know, breast cancer has been focused for the nation, but oral cancer, the dentists are not trained as uh, pathologists and medical doctors. So, so many times they got missed for the best window for diagnosis of such cancer. But we hope this uh, probe will generate uh, some momentum in the community to look into this type of uh, cancer. So we published this paper last year, got lots of interest, and we got uh, articles in Science Daily and got... Uh, many media interviews. I suddenly got many phone calls from uh, reporters from UK, from Europe, from Asia. But I think this is a, a very nice instrumentation which we want to push forward into clinical applications. So as a summary, I talk about these three topics. I hope I give you the brief idea. Once you leave here, you know I talk about these three projects, uh, microchip capture uh, circulating tumor cells, a way to do on-chip detection of those circulating tumor cells, and then microchips to do endoscopic imaging. And all these three link together to provide the idea of we really have this enabling technology at the micro nanoscale, enable efficient healthcare, and then really move the biomedicine moving forward. It's coupled nanomaterials with microsystems coming together, you really drive the frontiers, uh, deliver next generation of healthcare, and even some of the fundamental studies in biomedicine. 
And over the past uh, few years, I have fortunate to work with a large group of students. I only highlight part of them at uh, a postdoc and the senior graduate students and above. And I have a wonderful group of undergraduate students. So today I have a very good lunch meeting with our uh, graduate students and PhD students in Sierra School of Engineering. I, I know you all care about research tremendously, and I got a question about how to recruit more um, uh, students into engineering and medicine. I think this is a very attractive area. This is one of the future for engineering uh, development, and I really hope you can join the efforts to move the frontiers forward. And finally, I want to acknowledge all the funding agencies to support our, our research. And very lastly, in terms of coupling research with education, so I have this website developed uh, in my uh, group research website. The idea here is every project I talk about, I make them uh, like a movie, you know, like a multimedia presentation, which you can go there and click. You can see the motivations. You can see some of the feedback from the community. You can see the, how the device is designed, you know, how the uh, operation look like. It's a multimedia uh, presentation. And uh, let's see whether I can click. whether we can get it uh, launched. If not, I will just leave it for you, for you to look at afterwards. Maybe this is not online, but uh, um, for now, I think it's time for me to finish. Thank you very much. If there are any questions for our speaker? Yeah, that's yeah. nice. So <coughs> quantum dots LEDs, there are lots of effort be, before the, you know, beyond these slides I presented here, which we developed. So quantum dots LED is, it's LED. So it's uh, electroluminescence from quantum dots. And what we do that is we're putting quantum dots between two electrodes, essentially. Electron transporting layer, hole transporting layer, not necessarily to be metal. And then you apply small voltage to make them to illuminate. Okay, so fluorescence was the first part. When you capture the cells, you stain the cells within, uh, using different fluorescent dyes. Then you take fluorescent microscope. The second part is decoupled in that sense. It's now the quantum dots becoming illuminating light source. It's not a labeling agent. So quantum dots is a light source in that case to illuminate the cells. And the cell can still label the fluorescent dye and then you collect fluorescent so signals. I guess I don't Very good question. So we compare with conventional LEDs, and you can essentially package LEDs and make a light source. But the quantum dots LED is silicon compatible. You know, we, we see the potential of you can really integrate all the functions with the silicon quantum dots with compatible process make on a silicon wafer. And then you couple it with other technologies and then potential to see the integration with, you know, other functionalities for illumination, identification. So what materials are these? It's a cardium selenide zinc sulfide uh, complex structure, core shell structure. Yeah. I should make this clear. So it's a light source, not a labeling technique. It's a very good question. Yeah. I showed the video yesterday, but today when I came in, the computer was not online. So uh, you know, it's on my group website. I'm really excited to see that. And another question. Okay. Um, so your, your mirrors are one millimeter in diameter? Uh, the die size. Micro the micro mirror, the uh, this uh, dimensions for the circular part is uh, 100 microns. Yes, and what I was curious about is at least when I used to work in a field a while ago, we couldn't release something that was that big without having to have the holes in there. You do it with holes, or do you cross the release then? Yeah, so the it's a very good question in the sense of it's really involving the physics of the microstructures. You know, in the if we look at the physics 
of uh, devices, right? One example I give all the time is if you scale down in dimensions, the surface volume ratio getting increased tremendously. So at a small scale, the viscous force and surface force becoming very important. And reflecting Elsa's question, if you have a floating small structures, at a small scale, a few water molecules, a moisture can kill the device by simply sucking down the floating surface down to the substrate. So the way we're solving this is a multiple. In the engineering, in the clean room, you have a way to using carbon dioxide uh, to blow away the moisture and then release those. This is called, uh, you know, it's a, a way to release the floating structures in the surface micro machining. You have dedicated equipment to do that. Uh, but you mentioned a, po a point where we have these etching holes to get the material out. That's especially important when you have semi-closed space. You have no other way to get the material out. But this is a fully released on, on, on all farms. So the question, if I understand correct, is uh, uh, you still agree with me the interaction lens is important? That what? You still agree with me the interaction lens between the permanent magnets and then the, the blast stream, the sample, is very important? Well, that's, that's what my question is about, yeah. really, is why is it the factor? I mean, we could make the magnetic field to have uh, as much distance as you want to catch the cells. Right, theoretically, yes, yeah. And, and uh, so here we really come up with a design where you have uh, not too big, you know, have a tolerable uh, the magnetic field. And in this case, we have 0 0.5 uh, Tesla uh, magnetic field in the floating channels. And then given that boundary conditions, whether you can come up with a mechanism to close down the gap between the biosamples and then the magnetic field, having efficient capture and uh, during the screening process. But you are correct in the sense of if we just look at the cancer cells as the physical particles, you know, no matter what, you can come up with a huge mag magnets just achieve that 0 0.5 tesla in the middle. But many cancer cells, many cells are fragile. You know, it's, a, it's a soft structures. If you're not careful designing the mag magnetic field and the, the force field, it's going to blow up. Then that's a kind of another limiting factors from bio side. Right, so this put the two boundary conditions in such microchip design. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, I have a question about the, the microfluidic capture the CPCs as well. Okay. So obviously you want to capture as many of the, the true positives as possible. It seems like another key feature would be to minimize false positives. So not capturing cells that are not true CTCs. Right. Very good question. Very good. I look at you with the admirer and awe because you're right under the light. I cannot really see you, so I like to see the God. No, it's like that everywhere. Okay. okay. <laughs> I think that's a big light right in, under you. Yeah, it's a great question in the sense of, um, uh, you know, let me address this question from two perspectives, right? If you, I compare this technology with whatever, I don't want to damage the reputation from a big pharma company like Johnson Johnson. If you look over their instruments, that was one size fit all. No matter what, you have the standard testing tube, you have only one you know, antibody labeled, and that's it. You try breast cancer, colon cancer, prostate cancer. So all approach at least take a realistic step forward, right? We have a way to change the flow rate, like you said, change the particle size and tuning the clusters and, uh, and the modulate the magnetic field, right? So I talk about this. But you know, let me also come from another end saying, what will be the best optimized system for each cancer type? And you are right. 
So each cancer cell lines, like I said, from biological side, the column cancer, you know, the, the column 205, the PC3 cells, the SKBR3 cell for the uh, breast cancer, on the cell level, they all have different expression level. This is re remarkable difference, and there was no concrete data showing this exactly, you know, southern surface molecule patch with breast cancer, and that was four times more. <coughs> it's all based on <coughs> clinical experience. So this system really showed the promise of we can tailor these parameters. And what we find out for the three major cancer types, th this system really doing very well compared with, you know, the uh, standard uh, practice using immunomagnetic assay at a larger scale. But moving forward, I agree with you. I mean, if we have this system reliable for the major cancers, if we look at some other cancer type, uh, like even the smaller cancer type, right, the bone, bone cancers and, and, and then the uh, oral cancers, for example, we need to further tailor the system and optimize for that scenario. Yeah. John, what's the heterogeneity patient to patient breast cancer? Um, you have some clinical data, right? You start to get clinical data. Yeah, so heterogeneity in terms... From the same patient, not different patient. Different pa patient, pa not heterogeneous is the sample. You're looking for these circular cells. Right. Cells themselves. Right, so heterogeneity. Right, so heterogeneity, I explained it in two levels. And I think in one way, now we do very simple but functional enumerations. We count the numbers, and that seems to correlate uh, relatively well with what we can get using some other methods with clinical evidence. But heterogeneity is really, I think, the future direction where we can further look into. And this is the power for the microchip approach. And if you want to look into the mutations and compare the gene pieces based on the captured cancer cells, and this platform provides the capability of doing the single cell profiling versus if you just do you know, regular Johnson machine, cell search, and other, other machine doing the numeration, I think that will be the very first step. But heterogeneity, you know, the mutations uh, from the same patient and the variation from patient to patient, exactly that's a question we should address using this platform. Yeah. yeah. If there are more questions, I'd like you to meet with uh, George Ann. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much.